get started. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's candidate Zoom session. Uh, we had a great discussion yesterday with our NDP candidate for North Vancouver Seymour, Susie Chant. Um, and I'm so pleased that we have Harrison Johnston, uh, the BC Greens candidate, joining us today. I think it'd be a great idea, uh, since we are a smaller group, just to go around and do some quick intros uh, so we kind of know who's on the call and who, who everyone is. I know folks on our end uh, know each other, but I don't think Harrison has met everyone yet. Um, so I can kick it off and then I'll just go down the list. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Josh. Um, I'm staff for the CSU, the Director of Policy Campaigns. I go by he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm joining you all today from the shared stolen lands of the Jemenis, uh, Penelicate, and Saanich First Nations um, over here on Vancouver Island. And next I'll go to Emily. Hi everyone, um, my name is Emily, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the president at the Capilano Student Union um, and I'm joining you folks today from the stolen, shared and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples in North Vancouver, um, in the North Vancouver Seymour riding actually. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to be here and thanks Harrison for spending some time with us today. Great, thank you Emily. Uh, Shanti, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shanti Skopeta Lee. I'm the Vice President of Equity and Sustainability for the CSU. Um, I go by she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, currently calling in from the stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations today. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Shanti. And finally, but not least, when would you like to do your intro? Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Wen Jai. I'm the Department Representative of Education, Health, and Human Development. I'm calling in from the Slave to Nation. I use she, her pronoun. Thank you. Awesome. And Harrison, do you want to do an intro? I know there might be an opportunity to kind of share a little bit more a bit later. So if you just want to do a quick little intro so we know kind of who you are, that would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Harrison. I use he, him pronouns. I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh and North Van. Um, and yeah, I'm the BC Green Party candidate here in North Vancouver Seymour. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I think I will just hand it kind of right back to you uh, to kick things off. Um, just kind of uh, be great to hear a little bit about why you're a candidate, uh, what you hope to achieve if you were to be elected, um, and maybe some specific things if you know uh, that the BC Greens are, are gonna do for students. Um, and then we can kind of have an open question and answer session. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to type in the chat box and I'll kind of act as a bit of a, a facilitator and go down the speakers list. Um, and just a reminder to everyone to please be respectful and to be kind to everyone here. Um, no inappropriate behavior or language will be tolerated. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'd like to introduce Harrison a little bit. Uh, he's a student, a renter, a climate activist, as we know, um, and a lifelong member of the North Van Seymour community. Um, a year ago, uh, he co-organized the Vancouver climate strike that we were also involved in and mobilized hundreds of thousands of uh, people to advocate for their futures. And now he's here running to be MLA for the BC Greens in North Vancouver Seymour. Uh, so Harrison, why don't you go uh, right ahead? Awesome, thank you so much, Josh. So yeah, as Josh said, I was, uh, I've been quite involved in activism over the past few years, um, including organizing the big climate strike in September 2019. Um, and that is sort of the big, one of the biggest motivators for me um, in my decision to run. So I organized that climate strike, I saw people in the streets, I've met with our environment minister, I've protested outside his office, I've occupied the offices of MLAs, I've done pretty much all the activist tools in the book trying to get some real climate action out of our government um, and just haven't seen them taking the steps that are needed to be avoiding climate catastrophe and aligning with what science says is needed. Um, yeah, I've seen them double down on subsidizing the fracking industry and forcing pipelines through entity to indigenous territory. And I just can't wait anymore for our government to act because we need the action to start right now. Or well, we needed it to start about a decade ago, but uh, now is the best we can do. Um, 
And then sort of my big motivator specifically for North Vancouver Seymour, like this is the community I've lived here since I was three years old. This is the community I love. This is the community where I want to raise my own family. Um, but as many young people are experiencing, I am getting priced out of this community. The cost of housing has skyrocketed to the point where like when I moved into this community, my family moved in with a lot of other young families who were just moving in, starting their families in this awesome community. Like, there were kids all along our block, young families. Now none of that's happening anymore because no one, these young families can't afford to move into the community anymore. Our businesses are suffering because their workers have to commute from Burnaby and New Westminster and Richmond and these other places, which is ridiculous. Um, I'm, until, until the snap election was called, I was studying to be, become a high school teacher um, and high school teachers pretty much can't afford to live in North Vancouver anymore, which is completely insane. Um, so yeah, the big, the big things I'm running for is to really address um, climate crisis, obviously, affordable housing and just general affordability in North Van, um, and then transit. Obviously, this is a big issue for students and especially people who have to commute because of, because the cost of housing is so high. Um, the public transit system on the North Shore has just been really neglected by our government for about, I don't know, five, six decades now. You look at almost every other one of the 15 biggest municipalities in Metro Vancouver, they've gotten a new rapid transit project or bridge connecting them to another municipality in the past two decades. North Van, West Van haven't seen anything since the 70s um, when the C bus was completed. And that's simply not good enough. And I think a large reason for it is that neither the NDP or Liberals have uh, have been trying to win ridings in North Van, like they've been relatively safe liberal ridings up until Bowen Ma won. Um, so they were like, well, we don't need to invest in transit there because we don't need the people's votes. They're going to vote for us anyway. Um, and that's just obviously led to some big problems here on the North Shore in terms of traffic congestion and like bus service that just doesn't make sense and is not at the level that's needed to serve the people here. Um, so yeah, those are sort of the three big issues for me, which I know none are directly related to students, but are obviously, I think, the big issues at the top of mind for a lot of post-secondary students like myself as well. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Harrison. Yeah, I think a lot of, I think a lot of what you touched on is our issues young people, especially students, are facing. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that perspective. Alrighty, we can open it up for questions. I can see Grace already has her hand up. Uh, love that. So why don't you go right ahead, Grace? Hi, Harrison. First of all, I'm sorry I was late. Thank you for coming and speaking to our students today. We really appreciate it. Um, we've met before, but I'm Grace. I'm the VP External at the Capilano Students Union. And I just want to thank you again for taking the time to reach out to us like this. Um, so I missed the first part of your uh, speech <laughs> or introduction, um, but I guess my biggest question, one of my biggest questions uh, regarding post-secondary specifically is how can we make it more affordable? Um, and I guess what I would ask is uh, as a Green Party candidate, um, do you see any new initiatives coming forward to increase affordability of post-secondary education for students? The biggest ones, of course, would be grants, which are non-merit-based, um, or finding ways to lower tuition. So I'm wondering if anything like that has come across your table yet. Uh, so the BC Greens, our platform on post-secondary has not been released yet. Um, but personally, the big things for me, I mean, the first thing that I think immediately has to happen is a tuition freeze on international students' tuition fees, because the how their tuition fees keep getting jacked up to benefit the um, domestic students is just ridiculous. Um, and yeah, then I, I, I want to be working towards the end goal of free tuition for post-secondary students. Um, what exactly that looks like, I'll admit, I don't really have a plan for, but um, if I do get elected, that's going to be the top priority for me, is really like working with people who are experts in this field to work towards making tuition free for post-secondary um, and lowering the costs as much as possible in the short term before that. Awesome, thank you. 
sorry to throw you a curveball right out of the gate. It's just the biggest, you know, post-secondary relevant question we have. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, it's a issue for me. Like, that's why I decided to go to Langara College instead of one of the universities is because I'm paying half the amount of tuition per credit there and still getting my credits. I definitely understand the issue. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question, Grace. Next, we'll go to Emily. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, definitely tuition costs are one aspect that makes post-secondary education difficult to access for a lot of people. But then, of course, there's there's more than just the financial barriers. There's mm -hmm. the systemic barriers, the fact that post-secondary institutions, universities are very colonial institutions. Um, they are, you know, steeped in racism, um, you know, colonialism, anti-Indigenous, anti-Black sentiments and like structures. So, you know, have you thought about whether, the, I don't know if, yeah, the BC Greens have anything yet or what's your approach to what can we do to make our um, places of higher learning truly accessible for all members of our community, especially those that have been um, historically, you know, left out of um, limit, had limited access to higher education. Yeah, I mean, I think that a really key thing is just making sure that the people who are in decision making roles um, within post secondary institutions are representing the diverse slate of people and that we make sure that there is representation for especially Indigenous and Black communities um, who have been systemically oppressed throughout the system. Um, yeah, I don't have any specific policies on that, but I think just really making sure that those voices are in the decision-making room and are being listened to. Um, I think also just really doing everything possible to empower the students who are already in campus from those groups. Um, I know, I mean, I'm always incredibly impressed by um, what the SFU Student Union is doing up there um, in terms of just bringing, bringing the voices of students who have often been ignored into powerful roles within their student union. Um, but it's tough. It's tough. I think that really the key thing is just to be listening to those students, talking with the students. What what do you need? What were the barriers that you faced before you were able to get into this school? Um, and what can we do to uh, decolonize and like do this anti-racist work that is needed within our institutions? Great. Thank you. I'm back. <laughs> um, so apologies again if you addressed this in the first part of your introduction, um, but one of the biggest things for students, um, aside from housing and aside from climate change and climate justice more specifically, mm -hmm. um, would have to be addressing affordability from the other side, not making things less expensive, but allowing people to earn more. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, we know, for example, that a living wage in Metro Vancouver would be $19.50 an hour, but right now the minimum wage is much lower. Are the BC Greens hoping to try and get that minimum wage up faster than it's currently going up? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when the BC NDP were trying to raise the minimum wage to $15 earlier, I mean, I know the BC Greens sometimes get some heat for this, but they specifically um, asked for there to be an independent commission to decide on what the minimum wage should be and how we, like what, at what increments we should be raising it. So that commission, um, what they had agreed to, what they found and what they said that the government should be doing was raising the minimum wage to 1520. So like raising it by, I believe it's 60 cents every year um, that the this current government was in power. Um, so I would like to see that continue. I think that we need to be working towards a living wage as fast, as fast as we possibly can. Um, and also making sure that it's not going to destroy small businesses, but we need to make sure that people who are working in North Van are getting paid what they deserve for their labor. Um, so yeah, I would support, again, um, bringing back an independent commission to uh, work towards a living wage, because I don't think this is something that um, the government should be playing political games with saying, oh, we're going to raise the minimum, like the $15 an hour minimum wage is such a kind of like, it sounds really good politically because it is a topic of discussion quite a bit, but I don't think a $15 minimum wage is good enough. I think we need to do a lot better than that. We need to make sure that 
everyone um, is making enough money that they don't have to spend more than 30% of their income on rent, that they can afford um, all the basic necessities of life uh, in North Van. And I'm, I, I think the, the, I wouldn't be surprised if the living wage in North Van is even higher than the 1950. Um, I, I don't know if there is actually any research specifically into North Van, but I think you may even have a higher living wage than um, some other Metro Vancouver municipalities. So yeah, I definitely support raising it to a living wage. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for that question. Anyone else have a question? I mean, I can keep asking questions, but if somebody <laughs> else wants to go, that's fine. Harzan, I'm curious about the BC Greens plan for a four day work week. How, yeah, just, I would love to just hear more about that if you're able to speak to it. Absolutely. So yeah, this is just sort of based in the idea that um, like people shouldn't be having to, like that work shouldn't be the main like, driver in people's lives. People shouldn't be forced to go to work like nine to five, five days a week, just to be able to get by. Um, so yeah, this was Sonny First and Al's proposal um, was to uh, work, work towards and do some studies into the idea of a four day work week, which I know is also being discussed in some other countries. Um, groups here like the David Suzuki Foundation have had a four-day work week since I think the 1970s, 1980s, something along those lines. Um, and yeah, the idea is just generally like people should have time to pursue things outside of their career and should have time to relax, work on their mental health. Um, and yeah, what what exactly this proposal looks like is obviously um, there are a lot of jobs that aren't normal nine to five like week weekday jobs like if you're working in retail or a lot like pretty much all of the essential like the jobs that are considered essential workers or that's what we've been calling them during this pandemic um most of them like a four-day work week might not be workable because um but i think it's something that really should be studied and looked at um while also making sure that it's not going to have a negative effect on people because they would be potentially like losing wages. So like we need to make sure that if we're cutting people from a four day work week to a five day work week, that they're still getting paid as much as they would have in a five day work week. Um, but all of the studies, like a number of the studies that have been done on this show that a four day work week is actually more productive. Like a worker will get more done in a four day work week in three days of three days off than they will in a five day work week and two days off. So I think that we should make sure that people are paid accordingly for that as well. Um, yeah. Awesome. That, yeah, that, it sounds great. Thank you so much for, for answering that. Um, all right, next we'll go to Shanti. Um, and then after Shanti, Emily, you can, you can ask a question. Um, but over to you, Shanti. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think uh, one of the other areas that um, I think students are really concerned about uh, and even non-students non too, just uh, in light of the pandemic, uh, is mental health and just the, the fact that uh, I think the pandemic has, such, has had such a big impact on that in so, so many ways. Um, from like, you are isolated, you may be facing more fi financial barriers. Um, and I, I know that you talked a little bit about that uh, with the four-day four work week. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and sort of how you would want to approach that. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, first off, to start with, the BC Greens are fully supportive of bringing mental health care under MSP and ensuring that it is considered health care along as um, other aspects of our health care system are. And I would also like to include dental and eye care and... Uh, hearing care, all those sort of things um, under MSP as well. Um, but yeah, I think that in addition to just really making sure that everyone has access to um, like cheap or well free, um, hopefully mental health care, um, which is really important. I think that we really have to look at what are the underlying causes of um, people who are struggling with mental health like what is creating that and yeah a lot of it especially during the pandemic is stress around um 
like, will I lose my job? Will I have enough money to afford my bills next month? Um, am I going to get evicted? Um, and I just think that in general, those are things that no one should really have to be worrying about um, if we had in, in my, my dream society. So the things that I want to work towards that I think are, would really be crucial to improving people's mental health um, are a housing guarantee, a guarantee of healthy food, um, making public transit free for anyone who cannot afford it. Um, just so people don't have to be stressed and struggling with these things. Like no one should ever be worried that they're going to get evicted um, because they're, they lose their job because their boss got mad at them or something. Um, like it, people should always know that they have, that they will have safe housing and that should never be something that they should have to worry about. The same for food. People should never have to be um, like rationing money elsewhere to make sure that they can afford food for themselves, their kids. They should never have to choose between feeding their kids or feeding themselves. That's never something that someone should have to worry about. Um, and in terms of public transit, I, I think it's kind of ridiculous that a lot of people get these massive tickets for not being able to afford public transit, which leads to them racking up more and more debt, not being able to get driver's licenses. Like it, it just can have a massive effect on people's lives, especially young people. Um, and oh, and also um, in terms of uh, dealing with the overdose crisis, which definitely kind of falls into, like is very related to um, mental health. Uh, really, we just need to be decriminalizing drug users, um, as Dr. Bonnie Henry has recommended. Um, they like they've been we've it, we've seen that criminalizing drug users does not work. We've been trying that for decades now. It has not worked. The overdose crisis has just gotten worse and worse. Um, so we really should. That's another like we need to make sure that people if they're using drugs, aren't worrying that they're going to overdose, like that they know that the drugs that they're using are safe um pharmaceutical alternatives um there are probably some more things that i i uh aren't right at the top of my mind right now but yeah really just dealing with all of these underlying causes to people's um people who are struggling with mental health thanks thank you shanti for that question next we'll go to emily and then over to grace great thank you um, I was going to ask a question about the overdose crisis later, and you already touched on it, so thank you. Thanks for that. Um, but, but another question I have is, so in January of this year, we saw um, MSP premiums be reduced down to zero for um, most British Columbians um, and increased up to $75 for international students. And as a student union, we have a policy which is opposed to this increase and advocating for an elimination of these um, additional fees for international students. Um, so I was wondering, you know, what is your perspective on this? What's your position? Um, yeah, just what do you think about it? What would you do? Yeah, I mean, pretty simple. I just want to see international students pre uh, MSP premiums cut to zero. I think it's a pretty simple answer. And I'm uh, definitely good. that's something I'm going to advocate for within the Green Party, um, whether or not I'm elected. Sweet. Thanks, Emily. Uh, over to you, Grace. Oh, you're muted. Oh, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> All right. So um, we've touched on a few different topics and um, we've covered a lot of issues. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, though, more than any, you know, and this is something that comes up a lot. Um, first of all, we know that one of the most the biggest ways that we can increase affordability for post-secondary students is by reinvesting in public education. Um, I'm sure, or you might be aware at any rate, uh, that in 1979, over 90% of a university's budget would have been funded through public funding. Today, that number is 47%. We've seen similar cuts in critical resources like healthcare, like teaching, things like that. Um, so I wonder uh, if you might be able to tell us a bit more about the Greens' position on funding public services. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think in general, we're very supportive of increasing the funding to public services that was mainly cut um, under the BC Liberal government. Um, obviously, like not our, our whole platform is not out yet, but some of the areas that I'll highlight that have been released, so for example, long-term care, 
um, the BC Greens want to bring the long-term care system back into the public healthcare system. Um, we've, we've seen that private companies are always going to prioritize their profits over um, the health and safety of our elders, our seniors. Um, and that's just unacceptable to the BC Greens. So we're going to work to bring um, long-term health care back into the public health care system. Um, and in general, I'm very supportive of pretty much bringing um, all essential services into the public health care system. And that really does include post-secondary um, education. Um, as well as, um, yeah, so like we, I, we really need to be increasing that funding and um, pushing back against the cuts that have been made to that. The same with our like public high school and elementary education. Um, I want to see the, the cuts that have been made there that have really are really having effects on students and teachers. Those need to be um, rolled back. We need to reinvest in that system. Um, uh oh there was something that i had just thought about and was going to say but i forgot now um yeah and then um obviously as i said like providing housing guarantee that's something that would fall under that would be public investment public investment in housing that's something that's really neat i think especially on the north shore where there is there is some public land um owned by the army or by the north end district here that could be used to develop public housing and um so that's definitely something that i would want to work towards um yeah i mean pretty much i'm just generally supportive of bringing everything in back into the public sector um or all the all the essential services that people people need and are like essential to people's lives yeah awesome thank you great thank you for that question anyone else grace i'm sure you have a follow-up <laughs> if you'd like it but i will open it up uh for anyone who hasn't asked a question yet Okay, not seeing any hands. Yeah, if, if, uh, if you want to <laughs> go right ahead. Or I have a question too, but sure. Yeah, you can go. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one of the biggest things that our student union is focusing on in addition to our decolonization work and allowing um, to create safer spaces that way uh, is working on combating sexualized and gender based violence on our campuses. Now there is um, a law in British Columbia, which mandates that universities must have um, a policy that addresses sexualized violence. But right now there is nothing in that law that states what needs to be in a policy. Um, and unfortunately what we've seen because of that non-clarity is that universities have created policies, some that are harmful to survivors, some that are not trauma informed. Um, and there's really just no regulation whatsoever. And we know that this has caused harm. So I'm wondering if the BC Greens would be willing to work with student unions to bring in stronger legislation to protect survivors. Yes, 100%. Um, I think that that's really crucial. Um, it, is, it is a big issue on post-secondary institutions, like campuses, unfortunately, is um, yeah, sexual assault. Um, and I, I find it kind of insane that there isn't more, more strict policies around what um, post-secondary institutions have to be doing to um, ensure that survivors are protected and treated as they should be. Um, yeah, I, I think that I would also like to see some real investments in making sure that, um, like, that if post-secondary institutions have the policies in place, that they also have the funding from the government to ensure that they are able to do what's needed to prevent this. Um, and I also, I think that um, some increased education in high schools um, would also be like really, really crucial to um, trying to, trying to um, kind of prevent this, these future problems from occurring in post-secondary. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a roundabout answer, but yes, absolutely, fully support that. Um, and the BC Greens would absolutely um, work with student unions on it. Awesome, thank you. I might ask a question. Um, so under the previous BC NDP government, I think we saw fossil fuel subsidies increase by 72% from the Christie Clark government. Um, to, to the tune of almost $1 billion, uh, which seems personally to me a little ludicrous in the middle of a, a climate emergency. 
Um, so I'm just wondering what plans uh, the BC Greens have if they were to be able to form a government uh, to either reduce or reverse um, that subsidies and um, if there's any plans for a major like green investment uh, plan as, as also a way to help to kickstart the economy after, well not after, but in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, I mean, the Greens are fully committed to ending all subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Um, for uh, We voted against them like many, many times in the BC legislature when both the Liberals and NDP were voting in favor of them. Um, and yeah, like personally, I want to see them ended hopefully within the next year. I think that it's ridiculous that we're um, investing so much money in propping up an industry that seems like it couldn't survive without this government money, which uh, doesn't doesn't seem to fit under our current system. Like the idea is this is kind of like, I don't know, socialism for fossil fuel companies, which is just a bit ridiculous that that's what we are, we're investing money in as when Indigenous communities still don't have clean water, when there are thousands of people who don't have a safe, secure place to live, that what we're investing in is uh, propping up m mainly foreign-owned like billion dollar fossil fuel corporations doesn't 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 really make a lot of sense to me um and then yeah in terms of in like if we're um cutting back those subsidies we should be reinvesting in the economy because there are a lot of workers who are um, dependent on the fossil fuel industry and there also are a lot of people right now who are looking for um new jobs in this economy so we i think we should really be investing um yeah, in both retraining current um, fossil fuel workers into a new green economy, jobs and renewable energy, um, and also just work looking at into ways that we can put people to work. Um, I had a call with a constituent uh, about a week ago where we had a conversation about um, like putting young people to work, restoring BC trails, which are like a really, and like BC's provincial parks, which are a really important driver of tourism. Um, and investing money in that and improving our community. Um, it's similar to what uh, happened in um, like after the depression with the New Deal in the US. Like they, they looked at who, who needs work right now and what can we put them to work doing that will improve our country. Um, so there were a lot of historians who were out of work and they got put to work. Um, like if you go around the US now, you'll see there are so many of these little like plaques and like important historical areas. Um, it's like like you, you can really look into the history of these cool small towns and all of that. That was all done um, for the most part after the depression um, and by uh, historians and workers that the government had put to work because they were out of work after the, after the depression. Um, and that's a big driver of tourism now. So I would like to see similar things happening um, coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic now. Yeah. Thank you, I, I really appreciate that answer. Uh, we have a question from Wen in the chat, so I'll just read it out for everyone. Um, Hi Harrison, I wonder what is the position of the Green, uh, BC Greens on childcare? I could be wrong, but my impression is that it's not part of the public education system and that childcare educators are not in the same position as K to 12 educators career wise. Um, and the availability of childcare is also challenging. Um, so just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this was one of the excuses that John Horgan tried to use for calling the election is that the Greens didn't support his $10 a day childcare program. Uh, and that was because the Greens are in favor of making childcare, early childhood care free. Um, so this is fully, we um, understand that especially for um, young women, single mothers, um, early childhood care, like er child care um, is really crucial to them being able to um, get jobs, participate in our economy, um, and not be stuck at home with their kids. Um, and for some people, many people can't afford the costs of daycare and preschool now. So um, the BC Greens are fully in favor of making um, childcare free for everyone. Um, and yeah, absolutely, the, the workers in early childcare um, really need to be prioritized. And I would fully support um, seeing them uh, kind of brought up to a similar level to teachers or, well, 
I mean, teachers also need to get paid more and deserve a lot more respect. So, um, but yeah, would fully support um, ensuring that uh, early child care educators are really treated with the respect they deserve. Because those are really crucial times in educating young people and making sure, like children, not young people, I guess. But uh, yeah, ensuring that they're really taken care of and feel um, like kind of love and at home um, in those early years. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next we'll go to Grace with another question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Harrison, what would you say to folks who, at, you know, they see a really ambitious platform that's trying to do quite a bit uh, to uplift people, um, but I'm sure that the biggest question the Greens get is, how do you plan to pay for this? So what would you say to folks who are asking that? Uh, I mean, the first easy answer is, as I mentioned before, like cutting back those government subsidies of fossil fuel industry that will bring in a lot more money. Um, and then on top of that, we need like the wealthy, uh, like 100 millionaires, billionaires, uh, these big corporations haven't been paying their fair share. Um, so I'm personally of the opinion that billionaires should not exist, and I'm fully in favor of um, taxing them out of existence. Um, and I think that that's what's needed for the broader good of our society. Um, these people have way, way, way more wealth than they could possibly ever need to spend on anything. Like if the, even with their $100 million houses and $50 million yachts, they still don't need like a billion dollars. Um, so, I'm fully in favor of wealth tax <clears throat> um, as an avenue to try to pay for these things, um, as well as um, looking into increasing um, property taxes, especially um, looking into the possibility of having um, different property, like a different property tax for someone who does not live here, um, like looking into that. Um, yeah, and really just making sure that the people who haven't been paying their fair share um, and have hoarded far more wealth than they could possibly need are um, kind of forced to reinvest that money into our communities um, through taxing, taxation. Um, that will just have a massive benefit on our broader communities. Like having, having money reinvested in the community is always a net positive and having it sitting in a billionaire's bank account is not positive in any way. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, any other? Emily, see your hand. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Harrison, you did touch on this right at the beginning. Like, you're obviously, you're both the party platform and yourself, your strong um, advocate for climate justice. Um, so, you know, Having grown up here, you know this very well. North Vancouver is a very unique area. You get people that are very much in favor of climate justice, and you get a lot of people that aren't really interested in it. Um, there's a lot of, like we're a wealthier municipality, wealthier area, um, and there's not a lot of infrastructure in place for a lot of the things that we see in like really sustainable, complete communities. Like, do you have ideas at this point for specific things that we can do? within um, like North Vancouver on the North Shore to, you know, bring people around to, um, I don't know, just like looking at, at this, like where we are right now is really a climate emergency that we need to make, you know, changes and or like investments for infrastructure, things that can help bring us into, to really a, like a forward thinking place to live, something that is sustainable. And yeah, so we can continue to live here for the long term, right? Yeah, I mean, I think just talking about like why people love this community in <clears throat> North Van, like a lot of people love having this wilderness in their backyard where they can go hiking and biking um, and just like enjoying that. Um, a lot of people like when they moved to the community, it was because there were a lot of like young families moving in. It was sort of a vibrant community that a lot of people were moving into like 20, 30 years ago. Um, and then really stressing to people like, this is the message that I have found is really, really resonating with voters is talking about like the experience I'm having is the same experience that your kids and your grandkids are going to have being priced out of this community. Like unless you can, you can afford to buy houses in North Van for like all three of your kids, like they're going to be priced out of this community. 
Um, so that's really, really been resonating with people. Um, and obviously in terms of climate, it's the same message, like, the fear I'm feeling about my future and the anger at our government in action, that's the same thing that your kids are going to be feeling and their futures are being jeopardized. Like we see, <clears throat> especially when we had like the forest fire smoke, like blanketing our city, like it's really people, people aren't, aren't happy with the status quo on climate and really want to see change. Um, and I think it's the vast majority of people in North Van. I think that the disagreement is more about what what sort of change we see, whether it's uh, banning plastic bags or um, ending the entire fossil fuel industry, like sort of there's some different levels of what people want to see and what people think is needed. Um, but I think that generally saying like all the BC Greens want to do is listen to the science. Um, we're going to follow the scientists and what they tell us is needed to be done. We're going to align the action that our government is taking with science. Uh, it's really, it's really very hard to argue with that or argue against that. Um, yeah, does that sort of answer that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I have a question on the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, we know that the BC NDP and John Horgan tried very hard over the last mm -hmm. kind of three years to prevent that from making its way to Metro Vancouver and, and coming through BC. Um, unfortunately, they weren't successful and the courts and federal government have, have deemed that this project should go ahead. Um, do you know if there's anything more or is the BC, are the BC Greens um, planning to do anything to further stop this project from going ahead? Um, if there is anything they can still do. Yeah, I mean, at this point, obviously, a lot is up to the court system and the sort of um, land defenders, indigenous land defenders who are on the front lines. Um, and a lot is up to kind of international, the international banks that are um, funding the project and that are providing insurance for the project. Um, a lot is up to that. One of the things that can still be done is that um, Trans Mountain can be required to pay to like pay up front or show that they have the money to deal with um, a spill if that is to happen. So the BC government can require Trans Mountain to be prepared for the worst case scenario um, spill on this coast. Um, and that would be just another at now, obviously, it would be another added cost for the taxpayers if Trudeau does decide to go ahead with it. So it's a bit of a um, like, it's a bit of a difficult decision. But I think that yeah, Trans Mountain is just so difficult because it is publicly owned um, and I, it's really, really hard to see Trudeau backing out on it, like compared to pretty much any other fossil fuel project that is privately owned, like they will back out if they don't think that it is financially feasible, like we saw with the um, tech mine, for example, tech frontier mine, for example. Um, and in the, for the most part, these projects are financially feasible if they aren't receiving massive government subsidies. Um, but Trans Mountain is just a whole nother issue because Trudeau owns it and isn't like, or well, the taxpayers own it and Trudeau really isn't willing to give up on it, uh, no matter how disastrous it is financially. Um, so yeah, there are definitely some tools left in the BC government toolbox, like Horgan says he's used every tool in the toolbox, he has not yet, um, but it's for the most part going to be up to the court system and up to hopefully activists being able to get to these companies that are insuring the pipeline um, and hoping hoping that they can um, they will drop off of that thanks so much grace okay great yeah thank you for that question i know it's a uh, difficult the whole thing it's the whole thing uh, <laughs> I know we're coming up to time, so I will kind of open it up for any final questions from folks, but don't feel like we need to use it just because we have it. I know we're all in Zoom calls all day, so take a 10 minute break if you'd like. But yeah, I want to give folks the opportunity to have any follow ups or, or final questions that they may have. Okay, sounds good. Harrison, I also want to give you the same opportunity if you have any kind of final remarks. Um, no, like no expectations for you to have them, but just wanted to also 
yeah, let you have that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I just uh, want to say that I'm, yeah, I'm really here to represent um, the voices that have been sort of ignored by uh, vastly liberal incumbent MPs, MLAs here. Um, so I'm really here to listen to students. So if there are any concerns that you have that you want to bring forward, um, I know that obviously most of you working on student union have a lot more knowledge about student issues than me. Um, and that's just really what I'm trying to do if I get elected and during this campaign is just really listening to people who have more knowledge than me and trying to do what I can to serve them. Um, and I, it's, the campaign so far has been really exciting. I mean, the, the things I'm talking about are really resonating with voters. Um, for the most part, it seems like they're, like I am up there being considered as a real alternative to Jane. Um, and I think that this is this is a riding where there is a chance for a young activist green candidate to break through. Um, and yeah, I'm, we're running an incredible campaign. I have an awesome team of, for the most part, my entire campaign is being run by young activists, mo many of whom are younger than me, um, which is really, really exciting. And I think it's really just showing that showing that a different type of campaign and that can be run in, pol in BC politics and that we can really do politics um, differently. So yeah, it's really exciting. And if anyone has any concerns, questions you want to bring up, um, my email is always open. I'm happy to get back to you on those. Awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you again for, for taking the time today. Uh, we really appreciate being able to hear from you. And um, as we said to, to Susie yesterday, if you are the successful candidate, we, we really look forward to continuing to work with you and uh, building a relationship and working together on, on student issues. So. Best of luck in the rest of your campaign. Um, and yeah, likewise, feel free to reach out um, to us if you um, have any other questions or anything like that. And uh, I'll be sure to forward you the link uh, to the YouTube once this is done so you can check that out and also share it to your uh, networks as well. Incredible. Thank you all so much for your time. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.